All right, cool. Well, I'm so excited to be here today with all of you. Looks like we have a great group of people. And um, like Dennis said, um, I'll be speaking for the next 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A afterwards. Um, if I do notice a question that you're writing, I may answer it, um, but I don't want to kind of stop the flow of things. Okay, so just a little bit about myself. So first of all, I guess you can imagine you're hearing an American accent, not a South African, but my ties to South Africa are very close. I was actually born in Johannesburg and my great grandparents um, moved to South Africa back in the 30s. Um, I lived in South Africa for a couple of years, um, moved back and studied there. Um, so my heart and soul is connected with South Africa and it's such a pleasure for me to be on here today. Um, to connect with all of you and, and to help you get your businesses online and optimized. Um, so a little bit about me. I run a digital marketing agency here in Houston, Texas called Optage. Um, we're a full service digital marketing agency helping people with SEO, what we're going to talk about with today, um, advertisements online, email marketing, some web design. I'm also a professor of digital marketing at the University of Houston. I teach master's level courses of SEO and digital marketing. Um, which is really fun. Um, if you have any questions after or want to get in touch with me, the best way is through Twitter or through LinkedIn. You can see over there. I've had over nine um, years experience. I'm really getting into the field at, um, at the end of 2010. Um, I'm also a musician and a husband and father of four boys. So really busy, uh, but have a lot of fun doing everything that I do. Here's a pic of my four boys, really cute. You can imagine my wife is an angel. <laughs> we almost have a basketball team. Okay, so today what we're going to talk about is we are going to have a short introduction when it comes to SEO. Then we're gonna focus on keyword research, which is one of my best and um, most exciting parts of SEO that I find. So we're gonna dwell on that, speak about on-page factors, talk about link building, talk about a specific area of SEO called duplicate content. And then finally, we're gonna end off with user experience. Now it's really tough to take everything and pack it into 45 minutes, but we're going to do our best. And obviously for those who it's their first time dealing with some of these issues, my suggestion is, is to write down some of the topics that speak to you. And there's plenty of resources to continue studying or learning. And if you have more questions, you can always reach out to me, um, but we'll do our best to get a good um, overview on everything when it comes to search engine optimization or SEO. Okay. Introduction. So we know that today the goal of marketing is to get found by customers when they're looking, not get in their face when they're not. We know traditional marketing advertising is all interruption based. I'm watching a, a TV show, I'm listening to a radio program, and an ad is coming my way. That's interrupting my experience. But now the world is people are coming online. They're searching for our products and services. And we need to be there. We need to be there when they are, when they are online. Because uh, that's that's the best point when I can create that relationship. And if they need uh, a plumber and I'm there when, when they have that need, perfect. If they need a birthday present for their child and I'm there, then that's excellent. That's, that's the point. So now moving into search, there's many different marketing channels online and there's different, different um, aspects. So specifically when it comes to search, and people going onto Google primarily, right? Because who knows Bing? <laughs> Most people use Google. Um, it's not about what you're offering, it's about what people are searching for. So an example or a parable to, to really understand this concept is um, how many people out there know Coca-Cola? Well, we're not gonna put a, a poll out there, but I can imagine that many people know the company called Coke. So imagine Coke, they've got billions of dollars to advertise and they decide to create a new website. And they build a beautiful website, wonderful pages, but they forget that in a certain part of the world, in South Africa, they refer to soda as cold drinks. And nowhere on their website do they put the term cold drink. All it says is Coca-Cola or soda. And in America, some people call it pop, but in, but in South Africa, cold drinks, and they don't have it anywhere. So imagine there's that university student at Vitz. He's searching for the best, the lacquerist cold drink online to find um, for his party and he types it into Google and bam, Coke, Coke does not show up. So obviously this is just a parable because Google's a little bit smarter than that. They understand that Coke and cold drink are the same thing. 
But the idea is it gives you a little bit of insight that if you're not, put, you know, you are so used to your business and you refer to things that, you know, in certain ways. But if you don't do the research to see what are my customers searching for, how do they look at the cert problem? How do they look at the product? And if I don't put that on my website, then I'm not going to show up. A lot of people feel they can just stick up a website and it's going to show up for what they want. But if they don't add in the content, the keywords, the products and services, it's not going to show up. Okay, so just, just so that we get on the same page um, and um, so that, we, you know, I'm sure there are some beginners here. So for those who are more advanced, please don't <laughs> jump off, but it's just to set the ground so we know what we're talking about. We know that the way that Google works is you go into Google, you type in a search query. Now we have a bunch of voice activated devices but it's just to clarify here that today's, um, today's talk, we're specifically talking about the organic search results. We know at the top of the page are ads or advertisements. Um, you can see this screenshot is from America because it's got the yellow ad here. And I know, I believe in South Africa on google.co.za, it's ADV for advert. Um, but uh, the point still gets across that um, the, we're gonna be talking about the organic search results. These results, I have no power of paying Google to get on. It's literally based on my website and the, and the strength of my website. And we'll talk about what strength means. Do I rank here? The top of the page where I can see the advertisements, both you can see I've got some product ads here as well as some text ads. Those we are not going to talk about today, but they are part of a Google or Google marketing or online marketing component. Um, maybe Dennis will invite me another day to speak about those, but the idea is um, we're going to focus on the organic side of things today. Okay, so what is SEO? These three letters that we hear about all the time. Well, it's the process of influencing natural search results so that your web page appears higher for the keywords that you'd like to rank for. It's basically clarifying to Google, hey, Google, please, this is what I'm about. Please show me. Now, just to go a little bit deeper to kind of understand it, I like to give this example of imagine, um, the, the pr let's talk about the problem of most websites and let's talk about a service-based website for now. You know, imagine if I'm a, a plumber and I've, got a, and I've got a website and I have a services page. So I click on the services page and there's a list of all the things that I provide. I provide leaky faucet repair, I provide, um, toilet repair, uh, shower installation, all these different bullet points. And most, a lot of people, when they build their websites, they have a, a services section and a bunch of bullet points. However, but let's think about this for a second. When someone is coming online and searching for leaky faucet repair, do you think that this services page that has all these bullet points, is it going to show up for leaky faucet repair? And the answer is no. Because when I search for leaky faucet repair, I want to see a page all about leaky faucet repair. Right. Same thing. If I uh, search for a pair of uh, of a red jersey, do I want a, a page of all the different jerseys and pants and shirts and all these different things? No, I want to see the red jersey results show up. And that's same concept when I'm building my website. Let's think about the experience that people want on Google when they're searching for something. They're going to want to get a page about it. If you don't have that page, it's not going to help. So getting into the slide, when it comes to SEO, it's not fast. We can't buy our keywords. There's lots of shady practices that you can do to try to game the system. And it's not about calling up Google. It's about hard work. It's about effort. It's about quality. And it's very similar to how I would say investments. You know, on the paid side of Google and advertisements, that's more like investing in the stock market or investing, things like that. When we talk about SEO, I like to compare it more to like investing in real estate, where often when I invest in real estate, it takes time, right? And the same thing with Google organic. It's not going to happen right away and it's hard work, but when you do get there, then the reward is there. Because when I get onto the first page of Google um, and someone clicks on my ranking and on my listing, then um, I don't have to pay for that, right? When someone clicks, they'll come straight through. So let's keep going. Now let's see why is it so important, uh, all of this SEO stuff. So I think we're going to throw out our first poll question. And the question really is here is, you know, when you guys are searching for a product or service online, do you go past the first page of Google when you search for something? 
right? So you go onto Google, do you go on the first page? And if you don't find what you want, do you go onto the second page or do you just remain on the first page? Awesome, so we have our results in. 63, so 38% of you are kind of like geeks like me or like SEO people where we'll, yeah, we'll go into the second page, we'll go into the third page, but the majority of you is kind of like the majority of the population. 63% say, no, um, we don't go past the first page. And so why is this so important? You can look here. What this graph is showing us, it's showing us where you are on the page in Google. So position one would be if you're on the top of the page, this shows that that's the click-through rate. Click-through rate re means the amount of times that a page of Google shows up and the clicks of that page. So we see that if you're in position one on Google, 35% of the time people are clicking on your listing. Once I drop to the second position on Google, that click-through rate drops down to 13%, meaning I'm out of the 100 times that people are coming to Google for my product or service, people are only clicking through 13 times. As it goes and as it drops lower, the fourth position, the fifth position, as we get down to the 10th position, we can see that that 100 times it drops down to people only come to my page, uh, come to my website three times. Once we get to the second page, which is, out, which is position 11, we can see that once we're at that second page, man, it's, it drops tremendously. So this shows, this is proof in the pudding. We have to be on the first page because when we're on the first page, that's when people will see our website. The further down we are on the first page, the more we're on the second and third page, the less chance people are gonna find us. And that's why it's so important. How do we get onto the first page Google? That is why we are having the webinar today to kind of uncover what is necessary for us to get to that point. Okay, now we're going to get into keyword research and we're gonna talk about conducting keyword research, choosing the right keywords, grouping those keywords and adding contextual keywords. And if that sounds like Chinese, we are going to get into it and clarify what that all means. And just remember, if you guys have any questions, feel free in the chat box to add your questions and we will respond to them at the end of the webinar. So keywords are the building block of search. Search engines keep track of websites and keyword-based indexes and search engines measure how keywords are used on pages. And the history of how keywords work with websites back in the year 2000, people would just stuff keywords in the code of the websites and that's how people, that's how Google realized what a page was about. But since, but as Google has grown up, um, how to get onto the first page and what you need is a complicated algorithm and it's like a secret recipe. But one of those things are the keywords and, part, and Google is gonna measure what keywords you use on your page and how those keywords are used. So what, what any business should do in the beginning and when they're starting off is to start with keyword research, figuring out what are the keywords that people are using to find my products and services. Now, you can see I have a slide here um, which has a lot of different tools um, usually I'll go through each one, but like I said, we don't, we have limited time today, but I want to point out a couple here. Um, uh, I can imagine that for South Africa, you know, when you're using, when you're looking for SEO tools or any tools on, online, a lot of the tools are based in the UK and the USA. Um, so that dollar or, pa or pound or euro conversion rate to the rand can be expensive. Um, so, you know, the use of free tools can help a lot. Um, if you can use a, a paid tool, I always say maybe just get one month and a, a one month subscription, get ready and use that month out completely and then kind of, um, you know, go from there. But here the idea is these are tools that help us generate ideas of what keywords are. So just some examples of what we're using is um, some free tools are ask your friends, ask your customers, ask, um, you know, go in your company, ask what do we think the keywords people are using? If you type into Google, Google has recommendations that will give you ideas. Google suggests, if you also go to the bottom of Google, often there will be, you know, people who searched for this also searched for it. Those are really great concepts. So uh, re the re ones that I wanted to show you also are, these are really great ones and they're based off of questions. Um, answer the public.com, 
and also ask.com. These are really cool tools, both free, that come up with questions that people are searching for and asking. So a lot of how people search online are based off of questions that people ask. Um, so if you wanna figure out what are the questions, Answer the Public and also Ask are tremendous. Paid tools, there's SEMrush, Moz, KW Finder, and SE Cockpit are the ones that I recommend. Um, the uh, SEMrush, I feel like is the creme de la creme, but there's other ones as well. And then finally, a freemium. Freemium are our free keyword tools, but they do have a paid component as well. As Uber Suggest is one that used to be much better, but recently I found one, seoscout.com slash suggest, and that is also a really cool keyword generator. But in the end of the day, we need to come up with keywords. So practically what this means, if I'm selling t-shirts, I want t-shirts for men, t-shirts for women, t-shirts that have pictures of Disney characters, t-shirts for princesses, yellow t-shirts, green t-shirts. This is what we're talking about. A keyword doesn't just mean one word. When I say keyword, I mean a keyword phrase. How do we come up with this list? It's by using a tool and by using our brain. And hopefully this will help you. Take a screenshot of the slide or the video is going to be available later. So you'll be able to always come back to it. Here's a screenshot from, I think, also ask.com. And you can see that it really gives you a lot of information, right? So I, I, I searched for spring, Springbok Rugby. And when I've got Springbok Rugby, you can see, okay, people have questions. How much money does a rugby player make? What position do small rugby players play? Who's the highest paid English rugby player? What's RSA stand for? Who is the strongest rugby player? Now, not all these questions are going to apply to my website, but it gives me a good perspective. Hey, these are the questions that people are asking. Do I have the answers on my website? Do I have the pages that answer these things? And once again, by using a tool, it will help me generate the concept and the ideas that I, that I, that I want. So um, pretty cool tool. And the nice thing is you can also export it as an image or as a spreadsheet so that you can actually get the questions in text form. Other ways that you can come up with keywords or topic, it would be YouTube, because we know YouTube is the number two search engine. So you can type in a phrase and see what comes up. Even Amazon itself, we think of Amazon as something that we used for, you know, to buy things. But Amazon, can all, you can also type in products or services and see what shows up. That will give you ideas. Quora is, an, is, a, is another question answer based website and it can help you come up with further questions that people are asking. And then I find something that's like a hidden gold mine is live chat. Um, I'm sure there's lots of people here um, when they go online, there's they lot, you know, instead of phoning someone or filling out an email, they, they interact with a company through live chat. Live chat is very cool because most live chats, you can get access to the transcripts of those live chats. And then if you can, um, download those in sort of a Word document, you can then analyze the words. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, there's these cloud builders or word clouds where I can throw in text mm -hmm. and then it builds a word cloud to see what are the words that are used the most and what are the words that are used the least in a form of a picture. The words that are used the most are the big words. Uh, words that are used the least show up as a small world word. Um, and I think a cool way is to take live chat transcripts, stick it into one of those um, word builders and then see what is popping out. What are people talking about? Do I have that content on my site? Okay. So now that I have keywords, now that I've got this whole list, which one do I choose? Which one do I start off with? Do I write an article about, uh, women's t-shirts or do I write an article about men's t-shirts? Where does it go from here? So when choosing keywords, there are three essential qualities of great keyword phrases. Number one, we want to find keywords that have high search volume. Are people actually searching for those words? The second aspect is low competition. And we'll discuss what competition means. But, but in order to get onto the first page of Google, it's competitive, right? There are already 11 people on the page. How do I get onto that page? So we'll talk about competition. And then the third one is intent, right? Um, Different keywords have different intents. We know that when it comes to the buying cycle or marketing in general, people are at different phases of the buying cycle. Sometimes you have people who are just shopping. They don't know what they want. Um, they know they have a problem, but they're looking for something. Then you have a, let's do like a car, for example. If someone's looking for a, uh, you know, a sports car, they know they want a sports car, but they don't know which one. So they're going to be searching in Google 
I'm looking for the best sports car out there. Then you've got a browser. A browser is coming along and says, I've done my research. Should I get a Audi or should I get a Porsche? And then you finally have a buyer when the buyer knows that they want the Audi, but they're trying to find the best priced Audi out there. And, you know, there might be a couple Audi dealerships. There's one in Santon. There's one in Ro Roseburg, um, different places. And the point is, which, which, one, which one do I want to get? So once again, I've got to think about that different pieces of content, different keywords are going to react to different people on their buying, in the buying cycle. And I need to hit all those people. I should have the content about what's the best sports car. I should have the content about what, what's better, an Audi or a Porsche. And then I should have a piece of content that covers what's the best Audi out there, right? Which is pretty awesome. So let's get through these different components. Okay, so let's talk about search volume. So our next poll is going to be, look at these three keywords. And I want you to tell me which keyword do you think gets the most search volume? What are people searching the most out there? Is it cooking, cooking recipes, or cooking games? And don't be scared. <laughs> and while you choose that, I've got, I've got my tea here, which is pretty cool, but it's actually five roses tea. Um, just to let you know that whenever I go to South Africa, I buy like five boxes of five roses <laughs> to bring back to America with me um, because that's the only tea I drink. Awesome. So we have our results coming in and I can see that cooking recipes are, we've got 43, 75% of our respondents cooking recipes, 23 of our respondents say cooking, and then only one person says cooking games. That one person who did cooking games, I wish I could send them over a thousand rand right now. Why? Because I love this poll. This poll is crazy because you can see that the, the keyword that's actually being searched the most is cooking games. And if you think about it, it's not really much of a surprise. People are searching for games all the time. I mean, that's what they're doing on their phone half the time. But what's the point of this, of this lesson or this exercise? Keyword research is fundamental. Looking at the search volume of keywords is really important because if I wouldn't have done the research and saw that cooking games is a million, I might have focused on cooking recipes, but there's only 74,000 searches of cooking recipes a month. But really, if I did my research, I'd say, oh, cooking games is the one that really hot right now. That's what I should be focusing my content on, on cooking games. So the point is, you do not want to rank highly for the wrong keywords. Without looking into the search volumes, I might choose one keyword over another. I've got to see, and, oh, that's what people are actually searching for. They're not looking for leather jackets. They're looking for plastic jackets. But that's the idea. And I hope this, th this um, and by the way, you guys shouldn't feel bad. This is not a South African thing. Anytime I run this poll, everyone gets it wrong. Um, but the point is that, yeah, so the question is, how do you find search volumes? You need to use one of the tools that I showed you. Um, there are free tools out there. There are paid tools, but you have to use a tool to get the search volume. And then I can compare and say, should I focus on this keyword or that keyword? Should I write this article or that article? But very good question, Lynn. Um, <clears throat> but it's about, you have to use a tool. But that's why I've given you some free options, some paid options. Um, we'll keep going. Uh, um, so the next, the next, there are some good questions coming in, but we got to keep going. Um, the next thing is how easy is it to compete in the SERP? So, um, so the next, the next point here was going to say competition. So we talked about search volume, the amount of searches that a phrase. Now I want to know the competition when it comes. So now let's look at a simple way to figure out competition. If I go to Google and I type something in, I don't know how many of you come up to here and say, okay, um, for this query, there's about 36 million pages on Google that I need to get past to get onto the first page. So uh, here's our next poll question. I wanted to know, do you think looking at this number, is this a good determining factor whether there is competition or not? So it's seeing how many pages indexed for a certain query, a good way to figure out the competition. So if you think this is a good way to figure out whether there's competition, you say yes. If you think it's not a good way, Hit no. Um, the idea is here, you know, for this phrase, there's 30, 60, 36 million results. Maybe for a different phrase, there's only 5 million. 
So is it good way of figuring out competition, which would be yes, and then we have no. So once again, we have a 60-40 split. 60 says it's a good way to figure out competition, 40 say no. And you guys should learn by now that I do the trick questions, so the answer is no. Because between you and me, I do not care about the 36 million results on Google. I only care about the first page. Because the question is, I like to look at it this way. Imagine that the first page of Google is kind of like a country club. Um, and the, it, you know, and if I want to get into a country club, I need to have a certain net worth, right? Only people who make $5 million a year, I have to drive a Porsche and so on and so forth. And that's the same thing for Google on the first page. I need to look at the 10 websites that are already on the first page of Google and look at them. How strong are they? Um, how many links do they have? How long have those websites been around? I need to look at the neighborhood of the first page of Google and based off of that neighborhood, then look at my own website and say, okay, my website has been around for 10 years and I've got this many links and so on and so forth. I for sure can get onto the first page of Google because the, the people on the first page of Google, that net worth is only 1 million. My net worth is 5 million. If I write a piece of content to focus on that phrase, I'll for sure get in. So what in this example you can see here, no, we don't want to look about the 36 million. I don't care about that. What I care about is imagine if I search for card swipe and pin entry time clocks, mm -hmm. I then got my results on Google. And you can see here, I'm using a tool caused by Moz, which is actually free. They have a Moz toolbar and Moz toolbar is giving me a difficulty score, which means from one to a hundred on a relative scale, how difficult or easy would it be to rank on this for this phrase, it's giving me a score of 20%, which if you can imagine from one to 100, 20 is relatively easy. And I'm not gonna go into all the specifics, but you can see that there is also a concept of page authority, domain authority, how strong is the page, how strong is the whole website. Um, and then that's also a score of one to 100, one being not so strong, 100 being very strong, and it's based off of different aspects. So what we need to do when we're doing our keyword research is not only do we need to come up with the search volume, how many times people are searching, but I also need to get a keyword difficulty score. How easy or hard would it be to rank on the first page of Google for this specific keyword? Now I'm gonna show you, here is a screenshot from Uber Suggest, which is one of those freemium tools. And you can see that when I search for my keywords, oil and gas marketing, gas company, crude oil, Number one, it's giving me the search volume. How many times are people searching for a month uh, per, per month? But it also gives me the SEO difficulty score all the way on the right. And the SEO difficulty score, once again, from a score of one to 100, relatively, it's gonna be a lot easier to rank for oil and gas marketing than gas company. Because oil and gas marketing has a SEO difficulty score of 15, while gas company has a score of 48. 40, it's a lot harder. Let me potentially go after oil and gas marketing. So remember, it's kind of a balance. I need to look at the search volume, but I also need to look at the SEO difficulty and balance. I wanna have something which has a lot of search, but I wanna have that difficulty score as low as possible. And a tool like this, Uber Suggest, will provide me with both metrics. Um, and it's really, that's sort of what goes on over here. Now, what's also important from a keyword research tool, especially for those in South Africa, is you wanna find a keyword research tool which gives you search volume in South Africa itself. Unless you're a global business and you're selling biltong in South Africa that you can ship to the UK and to Singapore and to Australia and to San Diego in the United States, then you might care about global search rankings. But if you're talking about the local South African economy, then obviously you wanna make sure you can find a tool where you can switch to see what's the search volume specifically in, in, in South Africa. Now, if I'm looking at oil and gas marketing, it, the cool thing is um, in the Uber Suggest tool, it will show me the, uh, the top 11 websites and give me an idea of what their domain score is. And domain score means like how strong is their website, you know, how many social shares does that website have and how many visits estimated. Now remember, this is all third party data, so it's not necessarily super accurate, but it gives you an idea of like, okay, the 10 results on oil and gas marketing, their average domain score is 40. If my domain score is five, it's gonna be not so simple to get onto the first page of Google. Whoops, 
the power of um, air pods. They keep falling out. All right, cool. So I hope this makes sense and you're starting to get the flow of things. Now let's move on to the next aspect of targeting long tail keywords. So often we want to be number one for the small keyword, especially CEOs of big companies. They say, uh, I want to be number one for electricity, or let's use an example for um, mobile phone. But when mobile phone, people are searching for mobile phone, are they looking to buy a mobile phone? Not necessarily. Maybe it's a college kid who's doing a research report on mobile phones. Therefore, when I often, when I'm targeting keywords, I want to go ahead and focus on long tail keywords. Keywords that are phrases of three, four, five long phrases that yes, that individual phrase not might get a lot of search volume, but when someone does search for it, they wanna buy. So you can see that on the internet, 70% of all searches are using long tail terms. Keywords that are four, five, six keywords long. Um, so focusing on those types of keywords, it's less competition, but there's higher conversion rates. Not many people are fighting on that. Um, but when someone does search for it, they're going to buy. It's 70% of all queries, and it usually tends to be used by people about to buy. So, for example, you know, if someone's saying, I want the best price for a Samsung Mobile 5, that phrase, maybe not a lot of people, but the person who is searching for that is going to want to buy it. So if I write a piece of content on my website specifically about that phone, I might not get a thousand visits, but the five that I do go, do get are going to convert well. Okay, now that I have all my keywords and, I, and I've started to figure out which ones have a lot of search, which ones are more difficult and less difficult, then the idea is let me take my keywords and start to group them together. Let me find the keywords that are similar and group them into groups in a spreadsheet or on a Word doc. Um, each group should target about three to 10 phrases. And ideally, there should be some common denominator. So if I'm talking about best Samsung cell phones, let me find all the keywords that are related to that. And once I have this group, think that I'm going to be creating one product page on my website or one blog post or article on my site that's going to target those keywords. And then I go ahead and actually take my article and write it up, include those keywords. Or if I have a product page, let me take the product description and write, include those keywords. And slowly, once I've done my keyword research and I've divided it into a thousand groups, this gives me a thousand content opportunities on my website to either add a new product or add a new blog post or add a new article to focus and target on those keywords. Now, by using the volume and the competitive metrics, I'm able to figure out what should I work on first. If I have a thousand keyword groups, should I do group number one first or group one number a thousand? Having my metrics there, knowing the volumes and the difficulties and the intents, I'm able to figure out what should I focus on first and what should I focus on last because I can't write a thousand articles all at once. The last part of this recipe is contextual keywords, um, which is um, filling the gaps in the visitor's knowledge. So contextual keywords um, is, in short, that imagine if I'm writing an article about New York, or let's use a South African article. If I'm writing an article about South Africa, and I don't mention Pretoria and Cape Town, but I only mention Johannesburg, do you think Google's going to want to show this article for South Africa? Most probably not, because Google understands that an article about South Africa should mention Pretoria and Cape Town. If it doesn't, it's not comprehensive. An article about New York, if you don't mention Brooklyn or Long Island, it's not very comprehensive. So the point here is, is that when, that when we are writing our content, the last part of the thing is we need to figure out what do I need to include into the article that makes it comprehensive. What is the Pretoria and Cape Town of my article that if I don't include it, Google's not going to rank it because it's not comprehensive. So a tool that can help you do this is you can get there by going to bit.ly slash IBMNLU demo. The example I have here is if I'm searching for a master's in marketing, which is a degree, um, I can find the number one result for master's in marketing, which is, of course, the university that I teach for, bauer.uh.edu. I take that URL and I stick it into the tool. And the tool tells me, what is this article talking about from a keyword perspective? Oh, cool. 
It's talking about social media marketing. It's talking about customer relationship management. And it's talking about it from a computer perspective that from a 96% relevancy, meaning from a scale of one to 100, this or eight, let's do 87%. There's an 87% match that this article is talking about social media marketing. There's an 86% match that it's talking about customer relationship management. So long story short, if I was gonna write an article about masters in marketing, what do I wanna include in this article? So besides for the keywords research that I did, I better speak about social media marketing, customer relationship management, and well-respected career specialists. Because the number one ranking article on Google about masters in marketing has a very high correlation to these three topics. When I'm focusing on things, I better mention these three topics. So once again, the way that you could do this is type the, go to this URL, find the number one URL for a certain keyword or phrase that you're looking for. You add it into this tool. The tool will give you the keywords that this article is focusing on. The higher the relevancy, the more important it is to that article, which is a really cool concept. But this is called contextual keywords, filling in the gaps in your article to make sure that you have all the topics that are necessary. Do I have the Pretorias and Cape Towns of the South Africa article? Because if I don't put it in there, it's not going to be comprehensive. And Google wants to show comprehensive articles. Another aspect of, we need to think about intent. Intent is important. An example that I have is, for example, by plumbing. Um, or I, I have a plumbing um, client and you know they wanted to know the best um, water um, is a gasless heater. If I wanna rank for that, let me look at what are the results already on Google. Are they articles or are they product pages? You know, it might be that I wanna be number one for this term, right? Best flannel sheets set, but, and all I have is a product page on my site that has the best, you know, flannel sheet sets, but I don't have an article that's talking about what are the best flannel sheet sets. For keywords that you're trying to rank for, you need to go into Google and see what is Google showing? Are they showing product pages? Are they showing e-commerce websites? Or are they showing blog posts and articles? So, and you have to see, if they want blog posts, you better have an article about it. If they want product pages, then you better have a product page about it. Because if you only have product pages and no blog posts, and, it's, and Google's showing blog posts, then you need to make sure that you have that content on your website. A very important thing that most people forget about. Um, so just another poll uh, question that we have um, is, you know, there's different types of content on Google. We just out of curiosity, what type of content do you like finding on Google? You know, is it news posts? Are they lists, like top 10 lists? Are they definitions? This is the de definition of that. Is it an article? Is it a video? So just be interesting to know from the crowd, you know, what sort of content do they like to, to, to deal with or to discover? All right, wonderful. So we have a lot of articles, videos are very important, definitions, some news, right? News these days, we don't wanna read the news, but cool, great, great point. But the point here, guys, is there's many different ways of getting content onto Google. You have to, part of it is seeing what Google's already showing for that search query, and you need to match it up, right? So you could have the best website in the world, but if you're trying to rank for a certain keyword and all Google is showing is articles and you don't have an article, you're not gonna show up. Keep that in mind on the intent. All right, we just went through keyword research. Now we're gonna keep moving and we're gonna talk about things that happen on the page. We're gonna move through this pretty quickly, but we'll get the general idea. URL structure is a first part of, this is very important. The URLs on your website are really important. Make sure that they include keywords. You don't wanna stuff keywords in them, but you also don't just want numbers, especially if you're an e-commerce website. You don't want www.dannystore.com slash one, two, three, four, five. Make sure that you have keywords inside your URLs. It makes a big difference. Um, when we look at how our website actually shows up on Google, it's really important. That's why the URL is important, our title tag and our description. We're going to talk about those because the idea is that if it's not inviting, if you don't write it like an advertisement, then people are going to, ah, I don't like the first page. I'm going to go to the second. 
And Google is expecting a certain amount of people to click on the first result on Google. If let's say not that many people click on it, then Google might say, hey, we're supposed to get 35 out of 100 clicks on this one. We're only getting 20. Maybe it shouldn't be in position one. Let's move it a little bit lower. So the point is, is that a lot can be controlled on how does my website appear specifically? What's the title? What are the description tags? So a title tag needs to be an accurate, concise description of the page's content. Ideally, you want to keep it within 50 to 60 characters. That includes spaces. And it should include your most important keywords. A lot of people put their brand, like Danny's website, and then put the you know, information. Don't put your brand at the front. Maybe put it at the back. But it should be a, a sentence and very clear, like a headline, to get people to want to click in. You also want to pump up your titles. So you can see here that if I'm searching for software for accounting, the top two results here, I know these are kind of old, but you can see it's the best accounting software or the top 20 accounting softwares for small businesses of 2018. In your title tags, you want to make sure that you have these power words that's going to want get people to click through. So once again, whether it's your, um, you know, whether it's a product page or an article, here are some examples of great words that can pump up your title. A guide, the best guide to buying a car. Awesome, new, fast, crazy. I think in South Africa, we could put lecker and it would be totally fine. Proven results, amazing step-by-step. -step. Pump up your titles. Next is meta descriptions. Meta description is a description that shows up under the URL in Google. Sometimes Google decides to choose some words on your page, but you have control. Think of it as a headline. It can be promotional. It doesn't have to include keywords in it, but it would be good. Um, it's not used for rankings technically, but it should be 155 characters of a good advertisement that tells the person why I should click on your website and not on anyone else's. And that's a very important aspect that one has to focus on as well. Next is body copy, right? The actual words on the keyword. I've got, I know I've got some designers on the call here and designers like, oh, no, I don't want text on the website. Let's just put pretty pictures. Google still needs text on the website. It's really, really important. So um, we have to add, um, make sure that you have text. Now, obviously a product page, it's a little bit harder to put text on than let's say an article, but articles should be about a thousand um, words, incorporate your keywords. Um, you know, here I've got a whole bunch of recommendations when it comes to actual product pages and e-com, um, your description, benefits, reviews, FAQs, you don't want to keyword stuff. You don't want to have the same keyword a million times. You want to use variations or synonyms. You don't want to be thin content. Just a hundred words is not going to be enough. And if you are an e-commerce website, you don't just want to have your manufacturer's description because that's duplicate content. You don't want to have the same piece of content. You know, the he, if, if it's a, you know, if you have the same description on your website as that other person, Google's going to say, ah, I'm only going to show one of them, or maybe I won't even show either. There's a concept of rich snippets and schema markup. We don't have time to go in detail here, but you can see that on Google itself, um, sometimes we have additional things that show up, stars and rankings and reviews and the price. Um, this is doing extra code on your websites called schema markup. Um, and that's a new type of thing that you wanna add to your websites. Um, an example here would be, uh, this is like an address of a company and I know it's like very code based, but if I look in the code and I add schema markup, it tells Google very clearly, hello, Google, this is the telephone number. Hello, Google, this is the street address. Hello, Google, these are the opening hours. And that's the idea of, um, of, of the um, schema markup. Schema markup can also be done in a way of JavaScript um, or, or sorry, um, as JSON script that's added to the page, not in the code itself. Another important thing is image optimization. Um, and we want to go ahead and take an image and make sure that the actual file name of the image has the keywords inside of it. So don't just save it as PS5670, but it should be the keyword that you're focusing on. There's also other tags for images called alt tags and image title tags that you want to make sure that you describe to Google what those images are about. And when you add descriptions to images, not only does it help Google understand what the page is about, but then there's also something called Google image search, which will allow your images to show up there. And that's also a very important thing. Scaling is also important. That has to do with images, the size of the image to make sure that, it, um, that it, it's a lot smaller. 
Uh, internal linking is also an important one, making sure that you have links in your website to the different pages. That allows Google to go ahead and to pass through different things. Um, we are running a little bit late. I'm going to try to finish off in about two, three minutes, which will take us to about 50. And so we talk about internal linking, but external linking is an important part. Now, all things equal, the page with the most links wins, right? If my website has more links, that's better. But really, not all things are equal. And the idea here is, is that important part of the algorithm is I need to get links from third party websites into my website. So you can see that site A, it's got a link from sarugby.co.za and from the Vodacom Bulls. Those are two really important websites. And that's going to show legitimacy in the eyes of Google. Site B, it might have m more links, but because it's just a random link and from Jib Bob's rugby page and from a blog forum, it's not as important. So part of our algorithm is how do we get links to our website from pages from other websites that are relevant, right? If I'm a dentist, I don't want links from a gardening site. Um, and that's an important factor. So links are like votes, but not all votes are equal. The more high quality and authoritative the links you have, and they need to be relevant to my site. How do you get links? This is more of a PR aspect side of SEO. Um, you know, it, it has, we can talk about it forever, but really we have to look at it like, letting people know about us, having, letting people doing outreach to people, um, letting, you know, having an important story or PR opportunity quarterly and letting people know about it. Um, and it's about outreaching to people and making sure that you're listed and found where customers are spending their time online. We're going to talk in, I'm going to skip through duplicate content because we're running a little bit late. Um, I want to get to the last point before we move to Q and A. Um, user experience. And the reason I want to talk about this is because this is coming up in the in 2021. There's a big alg algorithmic change happening to Google. Until now, um, Google has not weighted page speed. So how quickly does your website load um, and the experience of the user that much? Recently, they did make some changes where Google is judging your website based off of the mobile experience over the desktop experience. So anyone who does not have a mobile website um, is at a disadvantage. So that's something that they were pushing for many years. I can imagine in South Africa where most people search the internet on their mobile device, you're gonna have a website that's very mobile friendly. But what I want to stress right now is there's a new thing that Google just launched called Core Web Vitals, um, where they are gonna be judging your website specifically these three things. Um, I'll go through it really, really quickly, and then we can move on to Q&A. But number one, largest content full paint means that when the website, how quick does the website load above the fold? If it loads too slow, that's actually going to affect your website from showing up into Google. Interactivity means when's the first time that I'm able to um, actually interact with the web page and load it and scroll, right? That needs to be within 100 to 300 milliseconds. And the loading above needs to be less than two and a half seconds. And then visual stability is a concept where sometimes a web page loads and then it moves. Um, that movement needs to be at a minimum. But the point that I'm mentioning this is that page speed and loading of websites starting in 2021 is going to be a key aspect of the Google algorithm. So if your website does not load quickly and it's not passing these checkpoints, you are going to be at a disadvantage for showing up in Google. Google's not going to want to show your website. So there's a lot more when it comes to this, but you can start doing research about core web vitals and Google's giving us a little bit of time to start looking into this and how we can optimize not just now keywords and content, but also the speed of our pages because that's going to be an important part to our um, to our websites and getting found on Google. All right, I'm sorry that we had to go a little bit quick uh, near the end, um, still judging how long it takes, but I think now we've got a good time that we can go into Q&A. Um, all right, so let's look at some of the questions that we have so far. Okay, so Jobul has a good question. With regards to using the correct and catchy coding or tags, am I supposed to know how to do this offhand or can a web developer help us? So yeah, today we spoke a lot about of coding. So the, 
the point would be that some of this coding is, it's not like not really required. You don't really need to know coding. Um, like if you have a WordPress based website and you download like the Yoast plugin or certain plugins, it will allow you to do it without coding. But yes, some of this, you will need a web developer, but beware, not all web developers understand SEO. And therefore, when you get someone to build a website, make sure that you have someone who knows SEO involved or the web developer understands SEO because you'll be surprised how many web developers do not know. So some of it you can do yourself. Some you will have to get a web developer to help. Um, okay, so we've got another question. Is it necessary to add image alt description versus image indexing? That is putting a description on the image itself. So. Um, but Musa, I'm not sure about the second half of what you're talking about, but yes, an alt tag is really important. And that means that in the code, and usually when you add your image to the website, there's a little field that says alt text or description. Make sure you fill that in and it should describe what the image is. And it should also contain keywords that you're trying to rank for on that page. You don't want to make it spammy, but it needs to be descriptive and tie into the rest of the content on your page. Ben is asking, how can you do SEO for a video? Uh, when we're talking about SEO for a video, um, that's like a whole nother topic. But I would say the first aspect is make sure to upload your video to YouTube and then take that video, YouTube video, and put it on your page. Um, Self-hosting is not as strong as putting your um, video on, on to YouTube, but we'll get there. Lisa wants to know how do links work? So Lisa, really, once again, I know we kind of went through that really quickly, but the idea is that, um, you know, you've got a website, like I said, you've got sarugby.co.za, and I'm a writer about sports in South Africa. Ideally, I want them to have a link from their website back to my website. Think of links as votes. And it's not just about having more votes, it's about having quality votes. So it's, this is really, like I said, more of a PR aspect. How do I get my name and product out there that I get links? A really common way of, of, of links is guest blog posting or reaching out to a site and say, hey, I've got a really good piece of content. Can I write an article for you? Um, another good way would be to interview. Like I could interview the, the owner of, um, I'm trying to think of South African stores, but I can't think of it right now, of Woolworths, right? And then if I read an interview about him, he might say, oh, that's so cool. I'm going to link back to that interview. Um, I let people know, hey, I wrote this guide, a 3,000 word guide about the best way to secure your house in South Africa. And then you'll reach out to different um, home building companies and say, hey, home builder, I've got a really cool article. Maybe you want to link to it from your website to, so that people can read about it. There's lots of ways of doing it, but that's kind of how links work. And it's important because it's part of the algorithm. Bonguma wanted to know on WordPress, what's the best way to add the meta description and all these things? Um, so Bonguma, Musa, um, you know, ideally you want to use Yoast. That's a really good plugin. I'm not sure, uh, you know, there's other SEO plugins out there which can help you add the meta description and different things like that. If you have a Shopify website, it's, you don't need a plugin. There's the room there to add those different things. You wanted to know what's a good plugin to use schema. My suggestion for schema is there's a tool called schema app. Go to schemaapp.com. It's a very, very good um, tool for schema, um, which I recommend. Lynn wanted to know, is there a limit on the long tail keyword? So I'm not sure what you mean, Lynn, by is there a limit? But I, I mean, really, it's just a matter of finding keywords that have three, four, five, or phrases that have five or five, five words, and you see that's what people are searching for, write a blog post, and the title is those five words. Then you've got a good reason for Google to rank you for that specific phrase. And like I said, you might not get a lot of traffic, but the people who do want to see that, you're going to be right there when they're looking for you. Um, <clears throat> Ruti wants to know if your budget is tight, should you spend your money on Google AdWords, on Facebook, or another search engine? So Ruti, I think what's important is you need to understand what, like the, how important is it for you to get sales today? If you need to get sales today, working on SEO, like what, I'm focus, what, what we focus about today, you know, it's going to take time for, for you to write content and do the research and, and build up your website and the results take time, right? It's not going to take, sometimes it takes six to nine months. So yes, you should be investing in your website, but if you have a limited budget and 
you're not sure what to do, you might have to go to Google ads or to Facebook ads first to start generating sales right away. Um, because SEO does take time, but in a best case scenario, you can do a little bit of both and whether you should do Google or Facebook, that's, that's, that would be time for a different lecture at a different time to discuss the difference between the two. I'm going to go back to the bottom of questions and see if there's anything else. Um, Warren Ho, um, oh, okay. Uh, we'll go here. R Rihanna wants to know how can you increase the page load speed? A lot of ways to increase page load speed have to do with the CSS and JavaScript files that are running. By optimizing those files and optimizing how things load, that will increase your page speed. Um, you will need to get a developer, but on WordPress, there are certain plugins that you can use that can help optimize page speed as well. But you will need a developer to help you when it comes to page speed. Um, Rian, I have a website we've just recently rebuilt into WordPress. We aim to have six new articles by the end of the year. I've just engaged an SEO specialist for optimizing our ranking. If you were to choose just one thing to do in order to improve ranking, what would it be? Is this where you would start? So Rian, I think that's a great question. So number one, you wanna make sure that the foundation is set on your website. Make sure that all the metadata, the descriptions and the tags and everything is there. The next thing is like I said, um, you need to really think about the content that's necessary. Now, six articles, remember quality is better than quantity. But think about all the different products and services. Is six going to be enough? Six might not be enough. You might need to increase that. Um, but if you make six very strong articles, and these are 3,000 or 5,000 word articles, and they discuss every single point, then yes, those six should be good. But number one is the foundation. Make sure that the foundation is there and do your keyword research and produce content. And then links are also important. So I, I know it's hard. There's a lot of things to do, and it's hard to prioritize. Um, Caroline wants to know, as a web developer, is it worth putting a link on a customer's website back to my website? Is that a credible link? So Caroline, you have to be careful. Google has penalized in the past for that. So what I would suggest is you can put the link, but two things. Number one, th that if that link shows up on every at the bottom of every single page, that could be considered spammy. So my suggestion is either put the link on only the homepage, or there's a certain thing called no follow and no follow is a special tag that you add to a link um, and my suggestion for web developers is when you do put a link there make it no follow um, because that will make it less spammy in the eyes of google so it's a great idea but you have to set it up in the right way um, sone wants to know that we skipped over duplication because of time she wants to know what are the three things to know about the topic Okay, so we'll quickly, the three things to know about duplicate content is specifically on e-commerce websites. The definition of duplicate content means that I have two URLs that access the same page. Um, or it means that I've got, a, 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 imagine if I've got um, a URL that says a red iPod and a blue iPod. But if I look at the actual pages, the pages don't look very different. The only difference is one says blue, one says red, but those pages are very similar. So when it comes to duplicate content, there's different levels. There's exact same content. There's, it's close enough. We, we need to understand that in Google's eyes, Google doesn't like duplicate content. So we have to make sure that we don't have duplicate content. And there are ways to resolve duplicate content, specifically with something called a canonical tag and sometimes by 301 redirects. So if you're interested in the duplicate content, check out the concept of what a canonical tag is and what a 301 redirect is um, but it's important, specifically on e-commerce websites, when you have lots of products, it could be that you're going to get a lot of duplicate content because one product can be found in one category and that same product can be found in a different category. The URLs are going to be very different, but they go to the same page. So it's a whole other topic on its own, but it's something that we kind of have to focus on. Um, so Stephen... Bruis is asking, how does Google tell a blog apart from an article? Apparently, Google ranks blog articles lower. So, Stephen, I don't think necessarily a blog would be ranked less than an article, but this is how I would look at it. Um, th th this is the downside of a blog. Because a blog has a date on it, that naturally, and then you show up in Google with that date, that date can outdate your content. So imagine if I have a really good blog post and I published it in the year 2020 or it's in the year 2015. Now in the year 2020, when I'm looking 
at, you know, I'm searching for different things. That blog post, it's, it says on there 2015. In year 2020, am I going to want to click on a blog post that was written in 2015? Most probably not. So the one disadvantage of a blog post is, is that the date can show up in Google. And if you don't update the blog post or republish it, something that was really good in 2015, every year that passes is going to outdate itself. So the solution is, if it's an evergreen piece of content and it lasts forever, maybe don't put it on the blog. Maybe make it as a static article. The second thing would be, make sure that those blog posts that are ranking well on your website, you need to periodically update them um, and add that, add a new, you know, republish them, change them up a little bit and republish them to a new date so that Google sees that they're new. And then in Google itself, they'll see, oh, if this is a 2020 article, that's gonna do really well. I hope that answered your question. Um, we've got one more question from Lynn, and I think that we'll round up our questions because we're running four minutes late. When I add something for Africa onto our website, I notice that when I search in Google for our keyword in Africa, when I notice that our website is further down the ranking, why is that as I've added new content with the word Africa in content and keywords? So Lynn, it would be, it, there's, like I said, it's a lot more complex than just adding the word Africa. Um, you, if you want, you can always contact me later and you could send that specific example to me and I could look a little bit deeper and give you a recommendation of what's going on over there. Um, cool. So I know that was quick, but I hope it was a taste that it comes to SEO and it gave you a little uh, understanding of what's out there and it can hopefully push you to start digging a little bit deeper into what's required to actually show up into Google. Thank you guys so much. And I'm going to hand it back off to Dennis. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, wow, that was an amazing presentation. We definitely have a new appreciation for Houston. Uh, I think we've gained tremendous insights into how to improve our Google rankings and get our websites to the top of the page. There are also some really valuable tips on, on how to drive web traffic. Thanks so much, Danny. Before everyone leaves, just a final reminder that all sessions are being recorded and you'll receive emails with links to them shortly. We look forward to helping you continue your journey of enhancing your online presence and ultimately generating more business. July has been all about learning how to execute the most effective social campaigns and SEO strategies to win customers and grow your online business. Our August, August webinars, as you can see on your screen, We'll be focusing on e-commerce and we'll be kicking off on the 12th of August with our new Versus series. The title of the webinar coming up is Shopify versus WooCommerce. These came up a little bit in today's discussions. This is where we'll help you choose the best e-commerce platform for your business. Booking for the next free session will be opening soon. Please keep a lookout for other correspondence, emails, social media, posts from, from the Online X team about these new Online X gatherings happening in the coming weeks. Thanks again for your attendance. Good luck with your SEO strategy. Thanks again, Danny, and goodbye.